are live, I think. So I welcome people um, who are watching on Facebook uh, to our latest um, Facebook Live, of course, via Zoom um, on, uh, on our particular COVID updates. And this week, of course, we are talking about arts and the events industry, which is, of course, one of the key industries actually in Brighton. Um, and uh, so it's really important that we think about it, but particularly with COVID, the cyclical nature of the events industry around certain periods of time has meant that COVID has disrupted that greatly. But there were also some great opportunities. Um, and there's a particular proposal, a letter that's out today that I'm sure Ian will talk a bit about, um, or not to do it recently, um, around culture in crisis and, and how we use some of, uh, some of that stuff, uh, some of our spaces that we have here in the city that we could uh, underutilize at the moment and we could utilize. Uh, so um, uh, we, I'll introduce the people we've got and then, as always, you can say uh, your piece and then we'll get questions. Please put your questions below on the Facebook Live. Um, and you can see those who are eagle-eyed, I'm not joining you from Brighton today, I'm joining you from Westminster. This is my uh, lovely Westminster office, as you can see, um, and that's where the staff normally sit, uh, and that's our meeting area, and this is me. But unfortunately, um, they're not here, and I am, because Rhys Mogg has insisted that we all come back to contract COVID and then get back to our constituencies. <laughs> Don't worry, Britain, you're safe. I've already had it and I've got immunity, so at least you know you won't get it again from me. But on to the real issue of the day. I've got uh, Ian Baird, who is the chair of the Brighton Event Industry Independent Committee. Epic. Yes? Yes. Have I uh, got that right, I think? Um, okay. uh, Josh Carr from Other Place Productions, who uh, most people will know um, as putting on The Warren, which is, I think, the biggest, uh, if not uh, one of the biggest components of the Brighton Fringe uh, every year. And uh, we've got Becky Stevens from Hybrid Consultancy. And so I think uh, you are probably some of the leading experts on, um, on this issue in Brighton. And I know that there have been a lots of thinking. Becky, particularly, you've been doing a lot of the consultant work on health and safe plans around um, how we reopen. Um, and uh, I mentioned earlier on um, the culture in crisis proposal um, that Ian and others have been working on. Look, I'm particularly worried, I know, on, 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 and we've mentioned this before, on a number of fronts, that the events industry often has not been covered very well by the COVID response so far, because it doesn't predominantly have a basis on um, business rates, property. You know, if, you're, if you have a property, you pay business rates, then you can draw down some of the government support. That doesn't exist for you, although there's some flexibility in Brighton Hove, and we're hoping some support will come through some of the discretionary schemes. Although the government's now taking it away from Brighton and Hove um, uh, because they haven't spent it all. Uh, um, if you didn't, if you didn't spend it first round. They've taken it away. They're threatening to take it away from the council, even though the council wants to spend it on the discretionary fund. It's the same in Lewis and it's the same in Plymouth. All of us have got together to try and call on the government to let the council use that money that was COVID money to support um, those who fell through the gaps. But we're still working on that. Um, and uh, we also know, particularly as I mentioned, this seasonal element of events industry which may particularly a problematic if we're going to come in the next few months i mean we might have a second wave so let's not uh, predict anything too much but if we're going to come out in the next few months particularly in part of the year where events traditionally are not um so common you know into the winter months how do we both adapt ourselves i.e as the i say ourselves yourselves events industry so that it is able to think in creative ways to put on events in different times of the year that we're not necessarily so used to. Um, 
but also in different ways because social distancing might continue in some form or another. So how do we do that? But also, how do we make sure that we get government support and understand for that period? So how do we have a sectoral deal? And I know there's lots of people talking about hospitality sectoral deal, and hospitality has many of the same issues um, as uh, the events um, and uh, um, arts uh, industry, but it's not, at least they have very often a property basis of that. So what we have to do also is get the government to understand the different nature of arts, but actually also the idea that the arts can also help contribute to some of these challenges. How do you get communities to start realising what has just happened to them? Particularly, we've seen in the news, not just marked by um, the um, awful uh, killing of an innocent man in America, um, but the report about um, how Bain people are uh, more likely to die because of COVID, twice as more likely some communities in Britain. So how do we use and enable the arts um, and other forms of um, gatherings to help people come to terms with that, help people tell their stories, which will be really important of this crisis. And so it's not just that us, in my view, um, need to be helped and supported for help and support sake, but actually arts and events will have a process in helping a country that is grieving, hopefully come back together and start to understand what just happened. And that's why I think that we need to understand of course, some of the economic measures will be part of a bigger hospitality system, but we need to think about the art events also specifically. Um, and hopefully that's what we will do today. We've got some questions coming in already, which is really fantastic. Please keep commenting below. We will try and come to everyone's questions. But first, I'd like to try and come to Ian. Uh, Ian, could you explain to us a bit about what your thinking has been during this time and some of the proposals that uh, you are coming up with at the moment? So yeah, thank you, Lloyd, and thanks for thanks for having us along today. Um, when the crisis originally hit, it became obvious that our industry, uh, the, the arts and events industry, were in for a rough ride. We were one of the first to disappear uh, from the streets, and we will undoubtedly be one of the one of the last to reemerge. In Brighton specifically, 70% of the events happen between May and September, which is the core period that that's being wiped out uh, currently who knows how long that will extend um what i was really lucky in is that i was in such a good community in brighton so we produced uh, we, we we invented epic which is the event producers independent committee it was a bit of a mouthful but that's <laughs> where we go for the short version um which was bringing people from from across the industry from the supply side and from the production side to look at two key things one was the acute response to COVID. Where can we be helpful? Where can we put our skills and our infrastructure into use? And thankfully, in the main part, that wasn't greatly needed in our area. Secondly was, how do we prepare and how do we work together to see a better industry out the back of this, this, uh, this initial crisis? So we've been working together to look at uh, what we can do to work together and, and push the industry forward into a better place. Some of the ideas that are now formulating uh, that's coming out of that group, one specifically, as you were talking about, was the idea of a, a cultural space at the Black Rock site. Uh, we're looking at the feasibility of this at the moment for a not drive in, but a cycle in theatre space and not just cinema, but, but theatre and, and performance space. Like you said in your introduction, I think it's really important that we start to give people the opportunity to tell their stories about this. We, uh, we as a as a species, thrive on our stories and our experiences, and and sharing them is how we come to terms and how we process those things. So, bringing those spaces about now and doing it in a way that is. Uh, manages the disease but gives us the opportunity to have that sense of gathering I think is really important and that's what we're really focusing on now is how we can reignite that need to gather but do it in a way that's going to work both in terms of disease and both in terms of ensuring that we start to feed some income back into the industry an industry that as you say is widely ignored by the current measures we're predominantly owner operators small limited companies self-employed who have seen incredibly limited support throughout this process um, and so we need to start reigniting that industry from the bottom up
Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ian. Um, and that rebuilding from the bottom up is what we now need to put our mind uh, to. Uh, Becky or Josh, I don't know which one was wanting to go uh, next. Becky, are you are you able to talk to us a bit of some of the work that you've been doing and your, your thinking? Yeah, absolutely. So um, hybrid consultancy, we used to do we used to do entirely health and safety for festivals um, and outdoor events, and sort of now we're you know helping other businesses and and uh, help working with the Brighton Hope Council again to see how we can get businesses in the city back on track. Uh, I sit on a organisation called the National Outdoor Events Association, and we've been. Uh, key in writing the plans to submit to uh, DCMS, the Department of Cultural Media, um, about how we can reopen the industry um, and in a safe manner. Um, so we've been inputting into that and actually working with the Epic Group on how we can make events safe and enable people to participate. It's absolutely critical. We are all 100% aware in the events industry that uh, we can't go back to just, we can't just open the doors and everyone come in. You know, we have to look at events at the moment that are designed from scratch and completely take into account things like social distancing and hygiene and protective equipment and making sure that not only are our customers and attendees safe, but equally that our workers and everyone working on the event is safe. And that's a, that's a huge priority for me from a health and safety point of view is that making, you know, that, that's critical and, that, and unfortunately all these extra measures come at a big cost you know suddenly a lot of the things that we're seeing a lot of advice that we're getting is some of it would be astronomical to implement and maybe not even practical um you know one of the things that we you know we really need are you know we really need a clear kind of roadmap and, and better guidance about what is really effective and, and practical so. guidance from national government has been one of those things that seems to come in a particularly sporadic and often not as helpful as it should be where we've seen that with schools and we've seen that with with kind of other sectors as well and this is one of those areas where i can remember saying at the beginning of this what we need is of course to be allow people to use their judgment but actually to give clear examples of each different scenarios that different people could be in and how people should react. Because as soon as you allow people to use their judge too much and you've not given them enough guiding uh, suggestions, you get into situations where you end up having arguments about whether someone should or should not be driven to Durham, for example. Um, and that's just one example of, you know, kind of the arguments that you have. Uh, and I think particularly in different sectors, that has been uh, that is that is very much at the case. There needs to be far more guidance and support. Uh, Josh, can you talk a bit to us about what you guys have been doing and and, and what your thinking is on this? So we we actually uh, run an event called the Warren uh, during Brighton Fringe Festival, which is um, uh, one of the largest fringe festivals in the world. Obviously, Edinburgh being way ahead of any of that. Um, and we open in May, so we got caught right at the end of our spending, but before our income. And most uh, operators uh, that deal with, a, with um, an event that large spend their entire year working to plan that event. Uh, one of the issues with that is that you place most of your income at one point in the year, which obviously we haven't received. Um, one of the important things for us as an operator is not just our survival to next year, but also the number of people that didn't work for us this year. And that's 350 people, um, some on PAYE, when they come and work behind the bars or part of the hospitality part of what we do, but also a huge amount of events, uh, freelancers that are specialists in what they do, which is the beginning of their season, um, a season that they won't see the rest of the summer for. And we know that it's so important for us to survive in order to allow those jobs to exist in, in 2021 and onwards. So it's not just about the preservation of our company, but the preservation of employment going forward. Um, uh, like Becky says, a lot of what we're trying to do is find a way to have some guidance and consistency. And um, because an events organizer, 
um, there's quite a creative group of people that work behind it and are willing to try and find methods in order to keep the public safe and also generate income and jobs for the, uh, for the events economy. However, without any guidance, it's very difficult to plan or even place ideas out into the ether to be evaluated. Um, I think that the important part of, of that safety element is it is astronomically expensive and um, provides a lot smaller amount of income um, for operators. So I think what we're looking at or trying to achieve, and I know that I've had conversations with Ian about this, is about the pooling of resources to reduce the cost of activations where all parts of the, the community can actually take a little bit um, of income in order to, to sustain this period of time until they can go back to their standard operation. Um, and I just wanted to echo a little bit of what Ian said, um, particularly within the fringe, because it's such an open access um, arts event, is that exchange of human beings telling stories. And because the fringe allows people um, who are not necessarily part of a big production company, who have an individual story they want to tell, to exchange that story with the audience, I think that the benefit of that to society coming out of the back of what is a very traumatic time um, is going gonna, is gonna to really support and the mental health and well-being of the community and the public going forward past the, the, the immediate danger of the virus as well. Um, and there is a risk of us not addressing these issues immediately and finding that in six months time that a lot of these organisations that provide those platforms have actually disappeared. Um, so that's where we are and I think so much of what we're trying to do is about collaboration. I think I think what's been incredible is it does feel like a new era for the industry where the support each other have given each other has been has been colossal and it, it might come out as a incredibly positive thing but without support from central government particularly in guidelines and planning um it it makes it very hard to find a future i think and that that's really what we need yes i think we we we, we do need uh, that support and some of that transitional support as well look we've got some questions here and we'll go to them some we won't necessarily be able to answer or that they, um, but we can think about them and talk about them. I'll read them out and anyone can chip in I guess, from our side and we'll talk a bit about, but also impact on the comments that other people have made, please do. So the first one here I've got, um, uh, Tanya McLeod. Hi Lloyd, query about self-employed event staff that live and work in Brighton and the impact of track and trace scheme, which I that is not up and running efficiently right away at the moment. Anyway, yeah, we all know that it's working, but when it does work, uh, uh, here the case here is what if we were an event and have an un, um, unknown COVID case uh, who's been told to isolate for 14 days, and so can't we work for the two week worth of bookings? Um, so she said, I guess the furlough scheme might cover it until September, um, then what? How will those workers supposed to not work um, and the spread of the disease following the guidelines to come out of workers, so who else will be affected? I'm curious from a manager point of view, yeah. the possibility of rapidly running out of staff as they're big teams uh, in Brighton and we tend to work in the same places. So there's a few issues here, isn't there, about just generally how do we, beyond September, if the furlough scheme's not there, we recognise the furlough scheme doesn't work for everyone anyway at the moment, how will people get support if they have to for two weeks? And secondly, um, more immediately, if you are track and trace and someone has COVID who's working with you or someone at the venue, someone just who's walked into the venue has COVID and has maybe made contact with good number of your staff or your staff have to go off. How do we manage some of that stuff? Ian, Becky, I mean, Becky, you've been doing some of the health and safety um, plans at the moment, haven't you, about this? Yeah, absolutely. So I can't really answer the first part. Um, I have had a look and I'm not really sure what the answer is on that I'm afraid but on the second part the a lot of the recommendations that we're putting together for um, event organizers are that they employ workers in teams and essentially so that there is some resilience um, so that it's only a small team that are working together all the time or a sets of teams within and those those teams are, are sort of isolated so that yes I understand that I've 
used to be, I used to be self-employed production as well when you come in and out of events all the time and everything but actually what I think events will be looking to do is to keep teams of people together so in essence when it helps uh, minimize the spread between uh, staff but also it helps with the resilience of the event for instance like the Warren that's running for a long time if they were some, you know to lose everybody so it's looking at shift patterns when people come in and how they how they kind of keep more in a kind of a pod system as it were. I know universities have to think a bit about this for mm. next year as well and you know kind of maybe they're going to house students and that they will then teach students in batches and you'll have one lecture assigned to one group of students and so if one person goes down and you isolate that unit that can happen in universities and teaching establishments easier than it can in systems where there's more of a drop-in situation with interactions with members of the public um uh, Ian do you have any thoughts uh, particularly about about this yeah, I think I think there's going to be some real challenges, and I think some of the challenges are going to be along the lines of some of the other big issues we've been trying to fight as an industry. For example, around sustainability, I th I think there's going to be a move back to disposables for a period of time. Uh, things like cups, gloves, masks, generating waste that we were working so hard, and I think as an industry we were possibly pushing well ahead a lot of other industries in terms of addressing some of these issues. Uh, but we're going to have to push back a bit on that and, and how we manage that without losing sight of the really big issues like climate is going to be a challenge. I and think that's a question that Kay Esther, actually exactly the question that she's out here, which is what can you do about the increased use of plastic packaging for takeaway containers? Is there a way around this? I mean, have you had any thinking of practically about how that could happen? It's, I think it's around uh, what we need is real buy-in from the customers. There, there, there's lots of single-use packaging and products that can be properly disposed of, composted or broken down using the correct processes. But we really need our audiences to think twice about buying into that for split bins, for example. We need to find a way of not re-interacting with, uh, re with that waste. Uh, we need the, audit, the customer to take it, use it, and dispose of it properly. So there, there's going to be a contract that's got two sides to really manage some of those problems. Yeah, I mean, well, just, oh, just, sorry, Becky. Um, go, Josh, you go, and then, and then Becky, come back in. One of the things that we found, I mean, we were on a, on a, on a fast uh, track to reduce, um, almost have zero um, single-use plastic um, as part of the entire operation, not just in terms of food. Um, because one of the issues that you have with a, a lot of the products that Ian's talking about is waste separation. Um, and uh, collecting waste that isn't separated properly actually will, is bad for the environment in terms of it cannot then be processed in the way that you'd hope the product would be. Um, so it does involve a huge amount of um, responsibility and engagement from the public in order to make that possible. Um, Single-use uh, plastics are, are a blight, but they do have an element of safety. Um, the issue, I guess, is, 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 is that it requires everybody to engage, which I think audiences maybe haven't been so good at in the past, um, um, as it's something we're all sort of learning to do. Yeah. Um, I just think going back to the self-employed worker as well, it's a, that again is a key issue in our industry of, um, and that was highlighted so critically at, um, you know, when we went into lockdown that they are not looked after, you know, that we, you know, and actually they are absolutely vital resource and we need to make sure that we are, we have better systems in place to support self-employed people, um, if, you know, if they're sick or if they can't work for a reason because they are absolutely vital to not just our industry, but to many, many industries now across the country. I think one the... of the things the Chancellor said, and you know, lots of criticisms that I have of the government, but one of the things that I think was quite reasonable that the Chancellor said, when he first introduced the self-employed equivalent of furlough, was that going forward as a country, we would have to rethink how we treat self-employed people and workers and that uh, whereas there's been tax differentials between them and there's been, it's made it extremely complicated, he said, there will have to now be a normalising of not only the tax arrangements, but what then people expect from the state for each particular category of person. Now, this is probably very overdue, isn't it? Because we know that 
then there's been a real growth of self-employed people, people who work um, with for many different people, um, so they don't have just one primary uh, uh, employer. And that change in nature of work hasn't really been reflected in either the tax code or in the kind of support the government gives as an expectation still in our legislation. Everyone just works for one big factory and that employer will look after them and be socially responsible. But it doesn't exist like that now. And to some extent, the events industry is probably at the forefront of that. So I'm hopeful that there will be some rethinking about this. My fear is, I try not to get too political on these things, but my fear is that the government's understanding of self-employed and even self-employed people in the events, um, performance and the arts is a very rich self-employed people who are big stars or big, you know, kind of producers. And to some extent, some of the comments when they introduced the self-employed furlough scheme seem to suggest that, you know, kind of they said, oh, well, and they're very wealthy kind of people at the very top end, don't worry about them. Without a bit of an understanding of actually how different people work nowadays. So I think it's really important that we start framing that debate now, because if we don't, they'll design a scheme that will change the way that they help suffer people, but won't the right kind of people. Um, and it's, I mean, Josh, uh, with other place productions, you're just, you're not really just an employer because you help facilitate space, lots of other people to come uh, and work with you, don't you? Yeah, I mean, we have the, we have freelance staff that are, who sort of work around the country constructing festivals and we're part of their annual year. We have um, staff that come on as, as uh, short term full time staff. And we also have artists that then come and make money there by working so I mean we have this year we were due to have 280 shows which if you multiply that some are one man shows but some are shows that carry a lighting designer a sound designer a director mm -hmm. that will be earning money from that as well and um, just sort of to add on to the self-employed part of it that is very I think very specific to the events industry is is that the the work gets generated in little pods. So if you were to go off sick and you were about to start a new project, it might be your only work that week, but it might be two weeks of solid work that, excuse me, that covers your, your rent for that month. And if you miss that work, often if you try to get in later, you'll find that maybe manpower has been reduced on the construction site because they were ahead of schedule or those flexibilities mean that if you were to lose uh, work at the wrong time you could lose a, a huge proportion of maybe your income over a couple of months and um, without an event to, to necessarily go and work on to earn that back because it is so project specific um, and particularly those who are unlucky enough not to see so much of the winter season which is massively reduced in work um, if you get certain way into the autumn you'll find that there isn't much work carrying you through to the, the new year so what I think what people sometimes see is can be quite inflated and, uh, and self-employed rates in the summer for for, um, for uh, production staff is actually because their winter is so dry and they have to make sure that they've got um, a nest egg to carry them through the, the, the lighter months. So I think it's incredibly difficult in terms of self-employed people having to take time off, particularly if it happens two or three times. Yeah, and I mean, there is a solution to this also that we just, we make sick pay. <laughs> Much better in this country. Um, I think, was it Australia that tripled it overnight when COVID came? Here in the UK, we didn't even do anything for sick pay. We added a bit of money on universal credit, but no increase in sick pay, 90 quid a week. It doesn't include your rent, to be fair, because you can claim the housing a bit, but um, it's still extremely low to be able to live on. Uh, it, you were to say something and I interrupted you. So I didn't yeah, know. I think uh, that's the, the part of what Josh was saying. It's a really interesting point is that 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 idea that the sick pay and that that idea of the seasonality of the work this year is of, of absolute importance. And that's where we need to be looking as an industry of where we can fill those gaps in the late season, which is usually very quiet and how we can make use of spaces in our city because indoor spaces are going to be very problematic, but it's going to be winter. So there's a real <laughs> there's a real mix up of two issues there and, and how we're going to utilize outdoor space in the winter in a seaside town without then throwing thousands of patio heaters out and, and uh, 
undoing some of the other good work we're doing. It's it's a problem, but it's not an insurmountable problem. And what's been so fantastic over the last two months is to see how people are starting to come together and collaborate. I think I've never seen a level of collaboration in this city, the, the, the likes of which we are seeing currently. There's what we're doing with Epic and, and these two guys that have been involved with that. The, the What Next group who have been uh, part of a national campaign that have a Brighton chapter. And then the um, Arts and Culture Commission, all three of these groups who have pooled a massive amount of collaboration are now working together to collaborate those three groups into an even uh, a bigger formation. So what we're really seeing is some excellent thinking around how we adapt to these th these uh, problems and it's that it's that sort of um open book thinking with people just uh, really going okay what if uh, and allowing people to say what if we tried this uh, and working those ideas through that's what's going to give us the opportunity to keep that ecosystem alive mm -hmm. into next summer when we can really start to get things rolling again I've got a question here from Bob's Common. Two questions, but I think that they are linked. Uh, Bob says suggests that we uh, and and maybe you guys and I'm sure you guys are uh, working with and getting on board independent venue operators. Suggest someone from Brunswick, someone else in our constituency, but says that independent venue operators. Um, uh, uh, the year-round backbone of the art and events industry in Brighton. Um, and uh, says, what will become of venues that are here all year round if they're not given support as well? I think it's a bit about understanding events, but also understanding that some of the spaces also are kept, kept open. I mean, I know many um, bars uh, and venues in, in my part of the constituency survive basically on two things a year the fringe which is now gone and pride which is um being cancelled we might get a mini pride back we're allowed to do something in in that the year but those two things keep many of the bars at the bottom of st james's going for the rest of the year um they also keep some of the kind of pieces you know the mob and others they keep them ticking over so how is there thinking about how we would help some of the physical spaces as well and what we do there? I think um, I, it's just from, from that point of view, having been so heavily involved with the Fringe for so many years, I mean, we used to run an all year round venue above the three and 10, which was at the bottom of St. James's Street, um, which is sort of where the company came from. Um, I know from our side of things, we're keen when we have some kind of plot um, of development to be able to put a project together and we've spoken to Brighton Fringe and I know I've spoken to Ian as well that if we did have an opportunity to put something together we would want to bring people who are part of that fringe community in and I think that's what I was saying earlier is that I mean in the events industry I don't just see as outdoor events I think it's events taking place in Brighton um, and I think that's sort of my point is that collaboration of resources and shared mm -hmm. platform shared programming split of box office sales allowing people to take the little pockets of money they need to get through um to get back to their standard operations later down the line where they, they have an opportunity to survive and i think so much of the event sector is purely talking about survival at the moment not profitability it's just how can we get ourselves from here to next year um, so i see them as a big part of it and i think that ian's doing a lot of work engaging and um, through brighton epic i think and and i know that our plan is always to be Part of that. I mean, the fringe culture is so is so tight, you know, in terms of everybody looks after each other. I think. I mean, if you just think of something like the Great Escape and all those kind of things, so the number of different small venues and independent venues that are used across the city is, is important. And if you lost them, the ability to put on those kinds of uh, uh, events would would be severely diminished. And that's the thing. We're, we're working. There's some great projects on on the slate as well that, that's helping out there we had uh, a guest speaker on our group this week uh, from the united we stream project which is looking at using empty venues currently sort of multiple venues to stream concerts it's a, a project that's international in 48 cities around the world now and brighton's about to launch their version of it so that's going to start reigniting some of these multiple venues and getting them back to life if only on a virtual basis and our plans around black rocket are 
we want to try and access the funding and get the community to get involved because if we can cover those costs of getting this in place and getting it up and running and to do it in a way that uh, me and Becky will probably have some long conversations about how we do it right and, and, and back and forth of that. But if we can make that right and we can get that covered, then the community groups who then come perform can take that money back out. They can take that ticket money. They can take their, their share of it. And we, it can be, it can be a portal by which we can maintain that survival of the of the groups and develop new work because there'll be a season next year and there's nobody being paid right now to write next year's plays. We need to keep that alive. We need to keep that rolling arts environment alive. And if we don't, we'll be much the poorer for it. I mean, we have had through Epic, we have had conversations with some of the independent venues and we are looking at how we can support them through Epic. I mean, some venues like the Marlborough, it would be impossible to get enough people in, you know, to, with, with current social distancing. And those are the sort of things that are clearly are a bit frustrating for the industry. The fact that in some countries you can have one meter, but here it's two meters. So, you know, and we're kind of all waiting to see if that might change at all, because then that would have a significant impact on venues, particularly the smaller venues about the numbers they can get through the door and what we can do to help them do that safely. Um, our independent small venues are absolutely critical to Brighton and what one of the amazing things that make Brighton so unique and we have uh, we'll work you know with them on many different events um, whether it's Pride or the Great Escape and I know that we're all really keen to support them to get back online in some way or shape or form so we are engaging with them um, it might just be on a one-to-one -one level depending if they've approached us or not but um, it is but equally every venue is different and not every not every venue might be viable to open at the moment which is a really sad thing could i just add to that as well i mean i think that particularly when you look at edinburgh fringe for instance um you'll find that even the larger operators are made up of many many little 50 seat venues rather than these sort of big auditoriums so a lot of those um big platforms for artists even that are, are not considered to be those smaller venues are actually made up of the same dynamic as a smaller venue so they also have those restrictions I mean most of what we do um, four of our spaces are below 80 seats so it, it gives you an idea and those are completely impossible to work in numbers at the moment so um, it sort of it reaches out that that's that space problem massively I think. One of the things that's really interesting is we're working I'm working with the World Fringe Network so I was on a call uh, with people from New York and Montreal and Finland who are all working from tall, small venues. So that is an amazing example of great international, you know, sharing of information and seeing what people are doing and, and the measures they're putting in place. And that again is another good thing that's come out of this pandemic is saying, right, what are you doing in that country? Does that work for us? How can we implement that over here? And I think that's what we're doing because without guidance from the top, we're trying to make it work from the bottom up, so. I mean, we've got, we've touched a bit, but to Tanya Ashdown says social distancing of two metres will knock out main door spaces. You, you mentioned this, Becky. How likely is it that we might get to one metre? I suspect more of a question maybe for me, but any of you can answer. My feeling is it's unlikely. Most Europe actually is 1.5 metres. The WHO minimum is one metre. But the... For every meter you add, you, I think it's half the risk. Yeah. Um, and so I think if the R rate comes right down and the infection rate and the death rate comes right down, you're able to start allowing people to get closer together, just like Bain's been able to re re um, remove the rules to cover your face yeah. now problem is in England at the moment we have the worst death rate in Europe the second worst death rate in the world and we have um, uh, an R rate is still too high in Brighton we think actually it's not so high but East and West Sussex it seems to be both about above one it's an indirect science so we know exactly um, and overall in Britain it's around that one, just under 1.8 figure, which is not probably good enough. So I, my answer would be, I don't think you should expect any move on that two metre rule yet, lest that R rate comes down. 
saying that, however, the government seems so reckless on the other issues that, that it might well, well get rid of all social distancing and the government will have a solution. Look, all of this will change, I think, if we get a vaccine. Vaccine might mean that everything can start opening up in phase. But even with a vaccine, it would be months to roll out. So it would, but things can start opening up in that rollout. However, I don't think we should bank any bucks on that at the moment. I mean, I think a vaccine, if we're lucky, might come for early part of next year. Would I think be, also, would be my guess. I think also, uh, and there's been a sort of a, a, a release from Festival Republic this week talking about uh, the route back to capacity of venues, mm -hmm. the, an effective testing and antibody testing system has potential to be of such uh, use to us in order to build customer confidence. If we get to a point where we can be sure that you've got a good period of, um, of uh, immunity with antibodies and we have a really effective nationwide antibody testing program in place, then people can begin to have that confidence and say, well, I've got the antibodies, I can start heading out. And I can start engaging in some of the uh, some of these processes, and whether or not systems can be put in place, as has been uh, suggested in some places, of linking apps to say I've had an antibody test and proof to to enter uh, establishments. And things these are the 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 clever and and joined up ways of thinking that, as we've said, we're not getting from no. government. We're no. not getting these pathways we're not getting these guidances so we're see, making our own I, I, I mean i i've heard that i have an antibody passport a few times I, 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 and i raise this with no idea one way or another but is there a problem that you end up getting some people who have had it and some people who haven't and then you get a lot of young people who haven't had it maybe stuck at home who then go out and seek it thinking well it's not going to kill me but I want the passport, I want to get out. And you then have a generation of other people who are older who don't have that capacity because their risk level is so high. Mm. Who, you know, is there a danger that you start to create different levels of people and perverse patterns of behavior? I mean, I, I, so, so I think this is why it was talked about early on. And then when people thought through some of the ethical issues, it kind of, it went quiet. But if we could get around that, I'd be really in favor of it. Don't know if, don't know how that would work. I think it's um, the I think it's the roadmap as well, and I think that as Ian's saying, like even if the dates are shifting targets to have um, phased openings or phased plans in terms of what it would look like, depending on where we were as a country, operators could sort of put moving plans in place that they would be able to yeah. go when we know when we move to this point that then that will be able to happen and be able to roll out different ideas or activations. It's so open at the moment that actually what's happening is people in our industry are proposing plans and sending them upwards to people who yeah. also are having to send them further up. And actually, if it came down from the top, it would be so much easier for us to look at how that works and then come up with some more consistent concepts across the whole industry. So we all had a consistent base to work from in the same there way. There are meant to be these one, two, three, four kind of alert, alert levels, which is useful that the government established that. Although it's still at four, it hasn't actually changed. So um, you could argue why lockdown changed if the alert level hasn't changed. But you have the different alert levels. But from it, you then need different actions that will be taken. So you know actions will be taken on alert level three. Uh, but the and I think I think what would be better in a it, for our for our industry and maybe for others as well is that actually if it was linked to an R rate. So for instance. If yeah. the R rate within your area is at I don't know, 0.25, then you know, yeah, it's absolutely fine for events of up to 5,000 to take place. But actually, if your R rate is at 0.75, then it's events of up to 500. Or, and, mm -hmm. you know, and those sorts of things would, would really help because actually, yes, we all realise that this is going to be an ever-changing scenario and there isn't going to be a one-size-fits-all. And again, like Josh said, if we could have a clear roadmap, a bit like they had in Spain, that in a month 20 you can have 20 people in a venue and then in this time you can have this and if that is linked to the r rate or to the alert system then people can start to think about what they're doing and getting back into business because at the moment we are all planning and we're creating social distanced events and what have you but it's all very vague and actually we haven't even got the kind of permissions yet for for things really to take place so no it's really confusing and 
a regional approach is also something that would really help, you know, that, that in your region, if the IRA is this. I think it would allow people uh, to then understand how it's linked to the local issues. The problem is most countries have got a restriction how far, even Wales, Scotland, for example, say if you leave your house for exercise or work, it should be within five kilometres unless you have an exception reason, five miles, unless you have an exception reason. In England, we say, go anywhere, drive anywhere, do anything, you know, kind of, um, as long as you keep aware, you know, look over your shoulder in case the virus comes and attacks you while you're not looking. You know, all this kind of silliness, really, in the messages. So there does need to be a more a regionalised plan, because we know, for example, it started really badly in London. London actually now is more calmer. And we've got some real problems in other regions in the UK. And unless we understand that, I, I, we're in a real problem. Look, Mike Kelly asks... Due to the expected reduction in capacity at venues and festivals, do you think that next year ticket prices rise or that um, drinks and food prices will also rise massively? This must be a concern for both sides, isn't it? Will costs increase? Or will you have to pass that on to the punters? And does that mean that these things are going to become more exclusive for those who can afford and not for others. Uh, have you had any thinking a bit about that uh, so far? Yeah, I think in the short term that there's going to be a bit of this balancing of cost against uh, experience. I know a number of operators, you know, with my company, uh, we work up and down the UK and a number of those operators are going for eight small premium events instead of two big festivals for example um and with that they're giving a more premium experience and pushing prices up and that and that's their that's their model um i think we've got to be so careful because confidence will be low uh, and we've got to be careful to bring our audience on that journey with us back to back to the sort of the the, the glory days as it were so it, i don't think I don't think there'll be a massive impact. I think we'll, we'll see some impact, but I think probably Josh knows uh, has a bit more on that. Josh, yeah. what's your... I think I think it's a difficult um, it's a difficult one because I think there's there's two parts of it. First of all, is perception, and I think that maybe outside of the event sector, some of the perception is is that uh, events operators make tremendously large amounts of money every time they put on an event, but the costs are astronomical so the margins are very thin in events and that's also true in theatre I and mean, uh, even large theatre shows the the, the profit lines are, are tiny um, so there is some pressure uh, I think that there's a few ways to look at it I think one is to reduce the infrastructure that you put in and so that you'll actually see a lot more pared down events maybe something that's gone a little bit further back than you would be used to so the production value is dropped in order to allow the public to access it so that's one way to look at it and the other one is is an increased cost um, uh, for for drinks, refreshments, tickets. And um, from our side of things, we're an open access festival. We pride ourselves on the average ticket price being eight pounds. We're naturally accessible to people, um, and that's something we don't want to lose. Um, however, we also don't want to see the collapse of the fringe network totally. So I don't really have an answer for it, but other than that, there's a million things on the table. And I think until you have those facts and figures about what is achievable with what capacity of person, people, you can't make those decisions because there's such, there's so much variable there. And, um, and that's sort of why we're sort of striking for some consistency because um, even the operators Ian's talking about are taking a punt on a concept based on the same information we all have. Um, and, and without those facts and figures, those budgets, that kind of weighing up the price against the, the number of people and the price per head as well, and the confidence of audiences to return, which is considered to be quite low. We don't have the answer to that question. And I hope from my point of view that we manage to keep festivals accessible and affordable for as many people as possible. I certainly don't want it to become something that is only a premium product for people. I think that would be tragic, really. Yeah. yeah, so I have a couple of clients who are uh, currently planning a drive-in cinema experiences across the UK and they are predominantly doing it to enable to keep their workforce going 
and uh, you know they're really not going to see the same profit margins one of the things is the increased cleaning the increased toilet provision because obviously every time someone uses a toilet it needs to be cleaned afterwards so you can't have you know your toilets out of action while they're being cleaned so there's a lot of other factors now to to consider within all that and they are obviously don't want to price people out um but uh so these are all the things that we'll need to be looking at moving forward yeah i, I think there's been a lot of trying to balance all the additional costs versus um how much you pass that on and of course how much we can afford to pay look we've had a good discussion um, now, I mean, the, some of the key things that I'm getting at is that we need far more leadership from national government about what the different levels uh, of lockdown look like, how we get back on our feet, that we've got some really great ideas locally, and I understand the council is on board with many of those ideas. They've actually been sure. fantastic. I, I just need to just make that note that the local council here have been brilliant. They're really engaged with us as an industry. Uh, they're working really closely with us to deliver what we can. So I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I really think it's worth mentioning that yeah. Brighton Home Council has been fantastic. I'd like to back that up as well and say that as an operator, we felt really supported and engaged with by the local authority, which has been really nice. And I think that's important. I mean, Brighton, uh, I guess his economy relies very much on that and the council will have a squeeze as well and you know I'm keen for the council to ensure that they don't pass any additional costs on to venues events um uh, uh, and arts providers but that's difficult uh, and it's difficult for them to make that pledge when we don't know what will happen you know kind of and we're having that discussion with pride and i'm sure that some of the other big events will have to have that discussion um Although my view is it was a protest, they'd have to pay for, council would have to pay for everything anyway. So um, uh, it's cheeky to ask for them to pay for the cleanup of the parade. But anyway, that's another discussion for another another day. But generally, council has been very good. You know, they're struggling and they've got £50 million shortfall um, in their budget this year. So how do we support everyone? And I think that that's the approach it needs to be. Everyone's going to have to, is going is going to suffer this year. But how do we all club together to make sure that we survive the next years going forward? And some of this thinking is really uh, important. Uh, I've got a final question here, but I, I suspect it's a rhetorical one in the sense of, do you think Fringe and Pride, well, Fringe already gone now, um, uh, will happen this year? Can these events happen in isolation? I suspect we know the answer. They've officially, it's either passed or they've cancelled. The question is, Will we be able to introduce substitute events this year, smaller scale, like we've just been talking about, across the city, small venues, or do we have to wait another year to get these things back going? I hope that we can get up quicker than having to wait a whole year, but we'll, well see. I think one of the major things that uh, we're doing with the local authority is looking at fast tracking. Because we're getting so little... Um, uh, understanding and we, we're sort of worried that one day the government might go well actually now this is now this can happen and we go well if you told us that was on the cards two months ago we could have been planning for it but now it's too late and um, because it takes a lot of time to even get smaller events together so what me and Ian are sort of working on and I think Becky as well is is, is we're trying to find ways that those normal legal processes that happen can happen quicker and the council's got an open door that when things change suddenly that something small or a version of something could take place before ne the end of the year to allow the public of Brighton to enjoy that, but also to support those events as well. I mean, certainly there won't be Brighton Fringe or Brighton Pride in the way that there normally is every year. That's a sort of given, I think, but um, I don't think it's off the cards that something is, is possible later in the year. And that's what I think we're all looking at, but cautiously, of course. Yes. All night sitting licensing committee to get through the backlog. Poor old Jackie. She'll be up all... <laughs> no sleep for all... no, no, I mean, Jack, Jackie O'Quinn is, of course, the chair of licensing uh, here in the city, so does all the um, events that need licensing. She has to sit on the panels for. Uh, let's wrap up. A anyone want to say anything else before we go? I think just to echo Josh's point, one sort of line I've used in a lot of these calls and conversations is um, we're an industry that can build you a town in a week, um, but but we need a couple of months to plan it. 
<laughs> so if we're given that space uh, and we're given that framework, we can build variable plans and we can have them with adaptation built in so we can be reactive, but we just need that roadmap. I, I think as well, one of the things to add in is that as well as talking to the council, we've been in a lot of contact with Sussex Police and, you know, they know that there are some very good professional event organisers in the city and, you know, we've been said, you know, if we present a good plan and, you know, they were, we're not going back and forth, then obviously that they will help us, you know, deliver things quickly. Looking at other countries, though, I think really you're going to be looking around about the 500 people, if we're going to do it in August or anything's going to happen, that would be my life. Small events, hopefully, still are fabulous. Yes. <laughs> I think one last thing I'd like to say is I think it's important to be thinking about this now because I think, I think with all of this healthcare and all of these major issues we've had, um, that frontline work has had to be thought about first and absolutely it should have been thought about. I'm not ever suggesting that it shouldn't be, but we should be careful that it doesn't fall off our radar, the events and cultural sector, because it's quite fragile and it may be that by the time central government gets to the point of making decisions about support, we might already be gone. And I think that's the important thing to remember. Perfect. I think you're right. Let's make sure that we support our arts events, small venues, independent places, to make sure that we are here next year and we have managed to put some things on. Look, I really want to thank you to Josh, Becky and Ian. I think it's really important that we have uh, these discussions. Uh, next week, uh, we are, hopefully we will have a discussion around Black Lives Matter, um, which has been, of course, on the fore, and which, as I mentioned, has some links also into how we um, work in Brighton as well. Thank you very much guys, for coming along, and hopefully everyone out there, keep safe, have a good night.